Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part four of Evolution Part One. So well, there's only a few slides left, so this should be a pretty short presentation. Okay, so let's think about evolutionary trends now. So if sufficient fossil material is available, a paleontologist can determine an organism's evolutionary history, referred to as its uh, phylogeny. So they can determine evolutionary trends, so things like changes in a specific feature or features over time. So some examples of this are the group Aminoids, or part of the, which is part of the uh, subclass of cephalopods called Aminoidia. And what we see in the fossil record is we see that they evolve increasingly complex shells over time. Another example would be something like the uh, Titanotheres of the Eocene. We see that this particular species uh, begins to increase in size and develops nasal horns and there's a change in skull shape over time as well. And we can see this because in both of these instances we have a really good fossil record. So here we have a couple of examples of ammonoids. So here we have an example from the Triassic, a cerotite. And you can see we have these lines on the surface there. Okay, so these are called suture lines. And you'll notice that the suture lines are you know, quite simplistic. You can see the curve there. You can see there's a little bit of, of topography there, but on the whole, they're quite straightforward. Now, by the time we're into the Cretaceous, we have the ammonites. They're actually a different species to the cerotites, but they're both part of the subclass Aminoidia. And what we can see is we can see by this point, the suture lines have become extremely complex, very, very convoluted. And you can see this change here on this diagram going from the, the early groups of uh, the the Aminoidia, so from the Devonian all the way through to the later groups, the Cretaceous, we can see these suture lines getting more and more complicated. We can also see the development of the Titanotheres, so we can see, so this is the Eocene, so about 56 million years ago to about 34 million years ago. We can see the evolution of this particular species, we can see their head shape changes, the organism becomes larger, and we see the development of nasal horns. And the reason we have this, we can reason we can we can track this is because we have plenty of fossil material to work with, and this allows us to see these changes occurring over time. Once again, this is us using the fossil record to essentially back up the theory of evolution. So evolutionary trends are understandably quite complex, and they can occur at different rates, and in some in some circumstances they can appear and then actually be reversed. So an example would be something like natural horses have been steadily getting larger over time. However, what we see is at some points during the Cenozoic, we actually see these horse species beginning to get smaller. So on the whole, the general trend has been towards getting bigger, but every once in a while we'll actually see a reverse in that trend and the species will uh, evolve to get smaller, probably as a result of some change in the amount of you know, food availability, for instance. So these adaptions, changes that we see, should be considered as having resulted from either a change in, the, change in the environment or maybe an attempt to exploit a new habitat. So let's go back to horses for a second. Imagine you're a horse, you're living there on you know, the wide open plains. Well, in that instance, there's plenty of room to run, there's nothing to get in your way, but also you're quite exposed. So in that situation, being big and scary is a good idea. In contrast, if those horses, let's say, then try and exploit a forest environment, well, all of a sudden, being a huge horse actually doesn't help you very much because there's all the trees in the way. As you're trying to, let's say you're trying to get away from a predator and you're trying to zig, zigzag between the trees, well, you know, if you're really big, then that's going to be a bit of a problem. So in that situation, being smaller would actually be an evolutionary advantage. So some organisms, however, show little obvious change for very significant periods of time. And these are, of course, the living fossils. We've already touched on them in an earlier presentation. And uh, you know, possibly the, the best example of this is a brachiopod. So it's, a, it's an organism that burrows into sediments along coastlines. And it's an organism called Lingula. And Lingula hasn't changed since the Ordovician. Excuse my spelling mistake there. And so Lingula has been pretty much unchanged for about 480 million years. And so if we look, so here's a, here's a modern day Lingula. And here we can see a Lingula fossil. And you can see there's practically no difference there. And of course, we've seen both of these pictures before. We have a modern horseshoe crab and an ancient horseshoe crab. And here we have a, uh, an a ancient uh, coleocanth. And here we have a fossilized version. 
So these are of course the living fossils and these organisms are just so well adapted to their environment that we're going to get little or no change because they're you know, pretty much about as adapted as they need to be. So it's difficult to evaluate changes that have happened in the soft tissue and of course that's a problem because the soft tissue is very rarely preserved. So if we just go back and look at this lingular fossil here, well we can see the shell is the same and what you, what you can do is you know you can do things like you can look at where the, the mounting points are for the muscles of the organism so you can see what you know have they changed if the mounting points change position that might suggest the the uh, the muscle of the organism is maybe adapting slightly but when it really comes down to it you can't definitively prove that because the soft part has rotted away and so on a, at a superficial level these lingular fossils do appear to be the same but we can't say definitively that they are the same there could have actually been very significant differences between these two fossils however those differences could have been exclusively limited to the soft part of the organism which we've lost and so you know even though these living fossils appear to be completely unchanged we can't definitively say that that's the case so, you know, so if there's some kind of minor change that occurs in muscle structure or let's say an organism, you know, evolves to you know, get a new digestive enzyme or if the organism manages to develop a, you know, a new improved immune system, we would have no idea. So living fossils either live under a wide range of conditions, in which case they're considered to be generalized organisms. And, you know, that, that means they're, they're well adapted to a whole range of different conditions, so they can survive in a lot of different environments. And a good example of that would be lingula. You know, lingula can pretty much live along most coastlines. However, there are also uh, situations where a, a living fossil will be so specialized to its environment that, you know, it, it couldn't possibly exist in any other environment. So one, th one of the things about living fossils that we have trouble with is we don't actually understand how they're so stable. Because when it really comes down to it, no environment, you know, stays the same forever. There will always be changes. And yet these organisms appear to have not really changed at all. So, you know, one of the issues we do have with living fossils is, well, we would expect there to be small changes, but we don't really see that. And so trying to explain that is a bit of a problem that in some, you know, in a lot of cases we haven't actually managed to, you know, to, to get over. So, you know, surely you're thinking to yourself, but if we were to wait another hundred million years, surely there would be some change. I mean, after all, evolution, you know, is random, changes in the environment are random, so surely there's going to be some kind of pressure which will lead to change. So the thing is, is only the first stage of evolution is a matter of chance. So the variation is what's, you know, what's randomized. What happens to, you know, when two individuals produce an offspring, you know, will a mutation be beneficial or harmful, those kind of situations, that's random. However, you know, once you actually have the offspring, natural selection kicks in, and that's not actually random, because natural selection is going to preferentially favor certain traits. And so you can have all this random variation in your population, but if that random population does not produce a trait which is advantageous, it's not going to essentially allow the species to evolve. Because as we've already discussed, in most instances when an organism is very, very well adapted to its environment, any changes that occur will actually often be negative rather than positive. So they'll actually be to the detriment of the organism. So if natural variation hasn't produced any beneficial variations, an organism just won't change. And so this is one of the things that goes all the way back to this idea of punctuated equilibrium, the idea that evolution occurs quite quickly in short bursts when there's some very large sudden change to an environment. And so, you know, we, we, we tend to see species being very, very, you know, being pretty stable for prolonged periods of time. And then all of a sudden something happens and then we see evolution really kick in in a big way. Okay, so that's it for Evolution Part 1. Uh, thank you for listening and take care.